Good afternoon and welcome to HIT Policy and Blockchain Update with Dr. John Holanka, CIO at Beth Israel Deaconess Health System. This is a webinar tweet chat combo from healthsystemcio.com sponsored by Optum. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com and I will be your moderator today. We are having a simultaneous tweet chat hosted by Kate Gamble, our Managing Editor and Director of Social Media. You can participate in the tweet chat in a separate browser or on your phone by using the hashtag HSCIOChat or you can simply view the tweet chat in the media viewer panel on the right hand side of your screen. We'll also be using the Q&A panel today which you can use to send your questions in as they occur to you, leave the default set to all panelists. And we're going to have a couple of polls we put out today which will be a lot of fun so those will automatically open when we launch the poll. And you can use the URL on your screen to download the deck and that URL's also been sent out in the chat box. Just so you see how we are going to spend our time today, first we're going to hear from Dr. John Halanka with his regular policy update and a little blockchain thrown in. And then we're going to hear from our sponsor, Optum, represented by Mike Jacobs, Senior Distinguished Engineer. And then we'll have our Q&A. So without fur further delay, let's turn it over to our good friend, Dr. John Halanka. Thanks for joining us again. Well, great. Happy to be here. Can you hear me okay? Fantastic. Uh, great. So I just flew in from China, and so having just spent the last week looking at policy in Asia and uh, you know thinking about what are some of the great mega trends we're seeing in healthcare IT around the world, I thought I would start us off with just a, a brief international r review and then take us right into what's going on in Washington. And just turns out I had breakfast this morning with the Chief Technology Officer of HHS, Edwin Simcox, who did give me a briefing on what HHS, CMS, and ONC are going to do over the next 60 days. So we'll talk about that too. So update from around the world. So what are you seeing in China? Well, as you know, China has 1.4 billion people. It turns out EHRs in China have no meaningful use criteria. There is no nationwide standardization program. There's very little interoperability. And that's because every hospital in China is run as its own independent business. And as part of my work in China, I was teaching a Harvard Medical School course, and I had 100 CEOs from Shanghai hospitals sitting in a room with me. And I said, well, would you guys like to share data across your organizations such that you could keep patients healthy and avoid redundant and unnecessary testing? And the uniform answer in the room among these 100 CEOs is heads in beds are good because we're actually paid when utilization of services occurs and we're not paid when people are still at home. So sort of interesting issue that China has. Like every society, we're starting to see aging, we're starting to see longer lives, we're starting to see, unfortunately, diets that have evolved from what was a very healthy, high-fiber, low-calorie diet to more Western diets. We see we're seeing more diabetes and heart disease and stroke and those sorts of things. So China at the government level, maybe not at the hospital level, but at the government level wants to begin to start doing data aggregation for population health, for building curated data sets for machine learning, for being able to deliver care to rural areas from urban areas using the wisdom of experts. Uh, so it will start small. Uh, they aren't at the moment talking about a nationwide meaningful use kind of program, but just a series of pilots. But you also have to stand what a pilot means in China. So they have asked me to build what we're going to call the common data set for China, which will include not only problems and meds and allergies and labs and RADs and care plans, but also traditional Chinese medicine data which would be acupuncture and certain use of fungus, plants, and other substances. So we'll start that pilot with one million people in Chongming, which is just outside of Shanghai. And so think about that. In the United States, we did the Framingham study in 1948 with 50,000 people total. And China is talking about doing something similar with one million as a starting pilot. So the scale uh, will be enormous. The rapidity at which they can do rollouts is going to be significant. And there's good academia, industry, and government alignment to create a common data set and begin doing that data aggregation. 
I think their issue will be once we gather the data and we find some interesting variation in quality, cost, then convincing individual hospitals to embrace IT and standardize IT. There is no Cerner, Epic, or Meditech in China. Every EHR is a one-off built generally by a small company that's approximate to the hospital somewhere. Now, what about Japan? Japan aging society as well, but a really aging society. 27% of all Japanese are over the age of 65, and it's only going to get worse. Access to care is a challenge, especially for those that are homebound. There's a significant difference in quality between rural and urban Japan. So the Japanese are very interested in telemedicine type technologies. But there's a challenge. And that is the Japanese privacy laws are much more strict even than the European general data protection rules. So if we're going to deliver more care to the elderly in their homes, build sensors, build apps, build cloud services, it's probably the case that the Japanese policies around using the cloud, using the Internet for healthcare data will have to change. I will be in Japan next week. Uh, trying to work through some of those issues because uh, cloud is clearly a good idea for a country that has as many natural disasters as Japan um, and we need to overcome some policy constraints. New Zealand has sort of an interesting approach which is there are only 5 million people and so universal healthcare identifier and how many databases do they have for healthcare in the South Island of New Zealand? One. So pretty straightforward to do quality measurement and machine learning if you only have one data source as the source of truth. So I do like countries that have five to seven million people and just agree. You only need one of something and standardize that one. And I'll be in Australia in a couple of weeks doing some keynoting in their FIRE conference, so we'll learn more about what's going on there. And I think Australia's challenge is it is a relatively small country and getting the expertise to develop some of these new ideas and technologies uh, will require them probably to consult other countries in the world. Now there is a typo here, I meant to say Europe, the UK, but knowing Brexit is causing a bit of disruption, it ended up as the England, so that's a typo. Anthony promises to fix it. Absolutely. What's hap yeah, so what's happening in England? <laughs> So, of course, they're doing a meaningful use kind of program there. You know, NHS is computerizing hospitals. They have the NPFIT program, and now there are some successors to it. We're starting to see EPIC roll out in places like Addenbrooke's. And the challenge there is, is optimization. It's a bit like the U.S. as well. We've got all these EHRs, but they're just transactional systems collecting data as opposed to decision support aids helping deliver quality, safe care, coordinated care at lower cost. So England's challenge, and similar in Scotland, is getting expertise. And so NHS England has decided to train 300 medical informatics experts. So you'll have this unique combination of clinicians, doctors and nurses, with informatics training that can help the entire NHS modernize its workflow and optimize these new EHRs that are rolling out. And remember, the NHS has 1.7 million employees, so 300 medical informatics experts is just a start. The Nordic countries have really done a great job, and I'm thinking Denmark and Norway, Sweden, with aggregating data and creating privacy rules that enable data liquidity. And I know this is challenging in the United States, you know, because Anthony, wouldn't you just say the United States, our political climate is a little fractured at the moment? Just a bit. <laughs> yeah, whereas in the Nordics, there's not just a homogeneity of culture and language and privacy policy. And I just, you look at the power when society agrees that it is for the benefit of all that we share data, we aggregate data, we measure outcomes because society funds healthcare. So shouldn't it be our moral obligation to contribute our healthcare data in, of course, a trusted way for particular uses? And uh, you know, I'm hopeful in the U.S. that we will get to similar thinking. India is worth highlighting because of the India stack. Um, if you decompose all transactions across industries, you can actually figure out what componentry might be reused to empower entrepreneurs' innovation. So, for example, 
Anthony, I imagine Guerra might be misspelled on occasion. Yeah. Uh, uh, so therefore, wouldn't it be great if there was a national mechanism for identity management? That wouldn't be named gender date of birth, you know, wouldn't be implanted RFID or something creepy. It would be things like a national biometric database. So whether you were buying a house or getting health care, we could identify you based on iris or retina or fingerprints or palm vein geometry, some kind of biometric approach. So India has created ADHAR, national biometric infrastructure for transactions in general. So good idea. And they've also created some generic components for data gets and puts for payment. So imagine sort of a, a national PayPal, as you will, and the idea that consent is something that should be recorded digitally. And there could be all kinds of consents. I mean, there might be consent for healthcare or consent for a financial transaction or consent around privacy rules. So I look at that and I think when we did the meaningful use program in the United States, we came up with standards and mandates, but we didn't build this empowering infrastructure behind it that would enable the entrepreneurs to build products. In a sense, we said, doctors, you must drive, but we're not going to build you any roads. So is it a, any surprise that we haven't quite got the degree of interoperability we like? We haven't even solved basic issues like how do I identify the patient and how do I record consent across entities? So India certainly gives us some interesting food for thought. Israel is doing a lot of great work with Internet of Things devices and some things to highlight. So if you're a parent, think about the level of effort it takes to get your child to a pediatrician for something simple like a sore throat or an ear infection. So there's a company in Israel that for $100 will give you know, parents a little kit and you just say, oh, well, my child has an ear uh, pain right now. You just take the ear sensor, put it over the ear, and it takes a perfect 4K HD photograph of the tympanic membrane and then forwards it off to a pediatric office for interpretation. Or the same thing with a sore throat. And uh, this notion that instead of driving for hours with an unhappy child and dragging them into it, a pediatric waiting room that's filled with microbes, <laughs> right? You just do this from your home with Internet of Things devices. So Israel really doing some interesting things there. And South Africa has deployed, like India, some early biometrics for the tracking of HIV data so that as a patient goes from clinic to clinic and maybe as a mobile worker and goes to north and south you know, locations, you can track HIV treatment and progress using biometrics. That's funded by the Gates Foundation. So I tell you all this because sometimes we have to actually look outside the United States and sometimes even outside of healthcare for inspiration on some of the policies we may want to create here. But let's go ahead and move on to what is going on in Washington, D.C. As I said, I'll give you the, the lowdown from Edwin Simcox, Chief Technology Officer of HHS, in a second. But we'll start with ONC and CMS. And so we know the Meaningful Use Program had an, it was the High Tech Act, that had an interesting word in it. it said that every stage of meaningful use has to escalate, has to be harder, more rigorous. The problem with that is that our clinicians have been so burdened by data entry and administrative activities, they're burned out. And so the last thing we need is you know, another stage of meaningful use with even more burden, for, because 50% of our clinicians already want to quit. So what has ONC done? So OMC and CMS have said we're going to replace the entire Meaningful Use program with a very narrowly focused program called Promoting Interoperability. And this is part of a 2,600-page rule that was published a few weeks ago. But, hey, good news is, Anthony, I can summarize it all in two slides. That's cool. Yeah, so instead of having 16 measures, there are six. Instead of six objectives, there are four. And let's go through those four objectives. They're very narrowly focused on interoperability. We know that in America today, well, at least certainly in Massachusetts, you know, I, I don't know in New Jersey if you have an opioid problem, Anthony, but it's a crisis in Massachusetts. 
And so we want electronic prescribing, prescription drug monitoring programs, opioid use contracts. You know, we want to monitor and measure clinicians and patient use of opioids, lots of education. And so in that regard, what ONC wants to move us forward to the electronic prescribing of controlled substances. And that requires two-factor authentication and the integration of prescription drug monitoring databases. So at the point of prescribing an opiate, the clinician has full transparent view of the history of opiate prescriptions. Uh, because as an emergency physician, I can tell you, in my training, it was not uncommon to see a patient on a Monday and give them a prescription for some small number of opioids and to see them again on Wednesday under a different name seeking similar opioid prescriptions. And so there's a whole series of protections in IT infrastructure to reduce the use of opioids and track it over time. So ONC is saying, you know, you'll get credit for doing that. We know that health information exchange, the coordination of care across PCPs and specialists is a very desirable goal. And yes, with meaningful use, we shipped summaries from place to place. That's, that's great, but remember the problem with meaningful use is we said you must send a summary. We never really said you have to incorporate and use the summary. And so what we ended up with was a lot of summaries in the bit bucket, right? You know, they went from place to place, but then they weren't used for coordination of care. So NC and CMS are going to focus on the closed loop referral workflow. So imagine that Anthony needs a referral to a cardiologist, and I'm Anthony's primary caregiver. Well, how do I know he went? Or if he <laughs> went, was there a care plan? And how do I help enforce that care plan to keep his heart healthy? And so all of this idea of I send a summary ahead of time to the cardiologist, cardiologist acknowledges that Anthony was there, sends back a summary of the care plan, I incorporate the care plan into my ongoing primary care, that's a very desirable goal. And next, the idea that patients should, and families, should be uh, actively involved in their own care. There should be shared decision making. We should make sure and deliver respectful care that aligns with the needs of patients and families. And there is a huge emphasis on using APIs so that patients on the apps on their phone, whether that's health kit from Apple or some arbitrary new app that comes knocking at a hospital or doctor's office door, can get the data about the patient for the benefit of the patient and families. And this is really a nice idea because it actually helps us a lot with privacy. So Anthony, we'll make something up. Suppose you don't want to share uh, some embarrassing aspect of your health record. Well, how do I instantiate that in a consent so that a provider only shares the information that you want? Well, it's hard. Whereas if I send the data to you, and then you decide what to share with whom. That's just a whole lot easier, both technically and from a policy perspective. So they'll pursue that. And then finally, we'll just double down on our previous work that we did in meaningful use for syndromic surveillance and immunizations and reportable lab. With the idea that instead of just sending our immunizations to a common repository, wouldn't it be great if once we did, there was an ability to query that repository so we could make sure that patients were getting appropriate vaccinations. So those are the four goals, very, very narrowly focused. And let's actually take a look at the scoring system. So you'll see that for every one of the goals I enumerated, there's a number of points. And for a hospital or doctor's office to avoid a penalty in 2019, you simply need to get 50 points. So you see, this is a 100-point scale. So pick what you want to do and do half of what it is that ONC said, and you'll avoid penalties. One thing that everyone should know is that in 2019, there will be a 90-day attestation period, and it must be done with a 2015 certified EHR. So, you know, here it is, almost October of 2018, and I guess the good news for folks on the webinar is because of the 90-day reporting period, which in effect 
could mean October 1st through December 31st of 2019. You have one year from this week to get your 2015 certified edition in place and get some of these functions that we've been describing working so that you can measure them in that last 90 days of calendar year 2019. So I, I think, you know, as I look at most of the stakeholders, whether these are AMA, AHA, you know, AHEMA, they look at this narrow focus with smaller numbers of goals and metrics, and they all kind of seem pretty reasonable, and they don't add a lot of undue burden as a rational next step for federal policymaking. Well, let's talk a little bit about what Edwin Simcox, that Chief Technology Officer of HHS, said this morning. We know that HHS, under the, when Todd Park was the CTO, came out with a variety of data liquidity um, initiatives. The idea that HHS is really the largest accumulator of healthcare data in the world, but it didn't really share it. And it de-identified aggregate data for decision support or machine learning really wasn't available in the past. So HHS is going to continue to work on building APIs, and these will use commonly available technologies like JavaScript, object notation, and REST, the sort of things that a, a Google or an Amazon or a Facebook would use for its you know, non-healthcare related stuff, so that you can start to get access to HHS data. And an exciting aspect of that is, you know, we had the blue button in the past where patients could get really a text file of their data. Well, moving that to a next generation so that even now from Medicare and Medicaid, you'd be able to get your clinical and billing data downloaded to apps on your phone because HHS will enable that function. And so they're completely committed to opening up that data to patients and to use these more modern approaches than they have in the past. So watch, he said, over the next 60 days, you'll see a lot of announcements coming out of HHS around the increased use of APIs, patient-focused and provider-focused. So it sounds like a very good uh, approach for the folks at HHS. What about the vendor marketplace? Oh, just a couple of words here. You know, so Epic, of course, continues to broaden its product line to build um, locally hosted uh, in their Verona data center, uh, software as a service, a smaller, thinner footprint for Epic called Sonnet with the idea that instead of software that is licensed and local on-prem hosted, it's hosted by a vendor or cloud, and that smaller hospitals at lower cost can get access to these services. So, you know, watch you know, as Epic moves more mobile, as moves more cloud, as moves more into population health and analytics, um, it seems to be a generally right direction. Cerner uh, seems to be getting a lot of good government contracts these days, right? So DOD, VA, Coast Guard, you know, so uh, we're, we potentially could see a greater degree of coordination and interoperability across government agencies, and certainly that would be a very good thing. Meditech has entered the ambulatory space, and their 616 Expanse version of Meditech is a cloud-hosted model which has a fully integrated inpatient and outpatient record. And I watched Meditech over the last year, and they have really accelerated their efforts on interoperability, on APIs, and moving away from the on-prem licensed software model. Athena, of course, was the pioneer of that cloud-hosted model, and we know that Athena has had a few challenges of late <laughs> uh, with a leveraged buyout by a private equity firm, and then the private equity firm backed out, and in theory there are new bids coming in the next few days, so we assume that Athena will be sold, but at something less than the $6.9 billion that was originally proposed by Elliott Management. So I think uh, Athena is a strong company, an innovative company, and hopefully they'll get through this distraction and in next, you know, within the next several months be able to get back on their focus on products and services. Any clinical works, I think everybody knows, has had a little bit of a rocky time <laughs> with the Department of Justice settlement for an assertion 
of fraud in the certification process, and then an additional fine that followed when uh, they did not follow the settlement agreement with DOJ. So, you know, they continue to work on their inpatient product and continue to be a strong player in the industry, but they certainly do have these legal distractions. That's where our vendors are at the moment. And, of course, I keep watching for emerging new vendors and because I believe that the uh, future of the EHR, as you'll see in the next two slides, won't belong to our core transactional vendors, will be belong to the innovators that are creating apps and services that wrap around the transactional systems. And how's that going to work? So as I think, Anthony, we talked about a little bit the last time, whether you believe that this FIRE or fast healthcare interoperability resource approach at HL7 solves all problems or not, it's a great new direction. Right? The challenge, since I've been doing this for 30 years, is a lot of the standards that we've used were so complex that you had to have substantial medical and technical training to use them. And what we're seeing now with the Argonaut project is that non-healthcare workers can integrate these data flows into products without a huge amount of training. And probably the best exemplar is Apple. If you pick up your iPhone, and not just the 10S, is that how we pronounce it? Or is it XS? I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, you'll see there is an app on it, you know, that Heart app, that has the Fire Argonaut spec built into the app and has the capacity to query any hospital in your neighborhood that supports that specification. So, you know, Apple's putting it into consumer grade products and we'll see an explosion of Fire and Smart on Fire apps that layer on top of Epic and Cerner and Meditech and Athena and the like, providing these services that are more usable and much, much more intuitive than the traditional transactional uh, EHR applications. Also seeing a lot of work in cloud-hosted services, and that means things like decision support services. And I'll give you just you know, a quick example of that. Um, you know, I talk to lots of companies around the world. You know, one Israeli company says, we've actually figured out that if uh, you have a series of CBCs, and your hematocrit's completely normal across those series of CBCs, but maybe is going down ever so slightly, but not outside of the normal range. Oh, and then maybe certain other parts of the CBC are still in the normal range, but you're seeing some white cells or you're seeing some platelet counts go up. They can actually do an early detection of colon cancer from a series of completely normal laboratories gathered over time. And that is just an ex one example of a cloud-hosted service. I'm seeing these pop up all the time where they can help do diagnosis, best practices, treatment, care coordination, and navigation by using simple data gathered from EHRs or from the, e the data on your phone to help improve your healthcare experience. So you can certainly an explosion of Internet of Things devices, blood pressure cuffs, uh, pulse oximeters, um, you know, even sleep monitors or sleep apnea monitors. It doesn't require you to have a sleep study in a hospital anymore. You just have a simple $100 device you put in your mattress, and it figures out if you have sleep apnea or what your quality of sleep may or may not be. And it connects to your phone and from your phone to EHR. So that's certainly a major trend. Also seeing a lot more adoption of telemedicine and telecare. We're starting to rationalize reimbursement policies. And now, yes, there's a CPT code for telemedicine and telecare. And so the idea that I'll be paid for keeping a patient healthy in their home and will recognize in a value-based purchasing or risk contract a, a, a payment for doing that kind of thing is going to be an important trend. And why is it we're seeing so many hospital systems merge? Because the idea is in if a risk contract, you're responsible for total medical expense and quality, owning all the means of production from the outpatient visits to inpatient to SNF to emergency department and urgent care is increasingly important with the idea that you're going to deliver the right care at the right time at the right cost to the patient. And telemedicine, telecare is an important component of that. 
And finally, I've certainly seen machine learning in the next in the last few quarters it, it really become a reality. It isn't just hype, right? It's not a peak of the Gartner hype curve. There are products and services that are truly helpful, whether it's the colon cancer detection one I mentioned or simple things like figuring out what patients are going to need ICU care, what patients are likely to be readmitted, what patient OR time we should schedule given the history of the patient, or best practice plans for the patient based on patients like that one in the past. So watch that as an important trend. Um, yes, there's hype in our industry, but machine learning is quite real. Well, I know Michael is gonna go over blockchain and some detail, but let me just give you the highlights. So everybody knows what blockchain is. Blockchain is a public ledger you write to, you can't erase. It is decentralized. It is not operated by a government or single corporation. And its real purpose is to build trust, transactional trust. So a couple of bits of advice for you. You know, the SEC is in the process of issuing regulatory guidance on initial coin offerings. Keep in mind, cryptocurrencies and blockchain are not the same thing. It may be that cryptocurrencies rely on a blockchain, but they are very separate concepts. So when you see a company offering a blockchain service in healthcare, maybe fine. When they, in the United States, say, oh, and we're going to issue an initial coin offering to fund our entrepreneurial activity, my advice is just say no, <laughs> right? That ICOs are just a bad idea in the United States. And I'm starting to see, you know, in blockchain startup companies, you know, a number of red flags, like we incorporated in a foreign land so we can issue a cryptocurrency without SEC regulation. And, you know, it's just a mess, so be careful of that. But there are some really great use cases for blockchain. And so, for example, uh, Michael will tell you about the Provider Directory Initiative, uh, which is a very exciting idea that we'll have a canonical place to figure out who a clinician is, what their specialty is, what their credential to do. And today, I can tell you, it's a thousand different insurance companies and a thousand different credentialing systems and a thousand different directories. So I'd love the idea of a single public ledger for that. And payers you know, certainly might have uh, blockchain um, functions for figuring out patient care preferences or patient consents for data sharing. And the idea that we put not necessarily medical data itself, but certain aspects of what we'll call non-controversial data, pointers to where your records might be, consent information in the blockchain seems quite valid. And pharma might use blockchain to ensure the integrity of clinical trials or clinical research. And certainly that uh, is a big issue for the FDA. My personal opinion, you know, blockchain has many variants. You know, there's Bitcoin blockchain, there's Ethereum, IOTA, lots of different models. Hyperledger is an open source project that's worth watching, has faster trans transactional throughput, and a great community of developers. So. As we uh, think of the uses of blockchain, Hyperledger seems to be a good bet. And last thing, and then of course I'll turn it back to you, Anthony, but I would just summarize the trends for this quarter as machine learning, replacing traditional business intelligence methods. So instead of those giant data warehouses with OLAP, we're seeing predictions of the future based on patients of the past, increasing use of apps and mobile technologies, access through APIs, the idea that there will be doctors delivering care to you without a direct face-to-face -face visit. And offices uh, are great places, but a hassle to get to, and you know, often there's expensive parking. So turning your home into a clinician office with Internet of Things will be an important trend. And that can commercial EHRs are transactional systems that are necessary and great for compliance but it's these new entrepreneurial efforts in the cloud and apps that are going to be the real area of innovation. So there you go. That is my update, and I will turn it back to you. Very good. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Halanta. Looking forward to our Q&A. Well, now it's time to hear from our sponsor, uh, represented by Mike Jacobs, Senior Distinguished Engineer with mm -hmm. Optum. Mike, thanks for joining. It's my pleasure. 
So to begin with, Anthony, I thought I'd give you an idea of what my role is in Optum. And uh, Senior Distinguished Engineer doesn't really begin to uh, describe what I actually do. So to help you understand that, uh, what that title means is that uh, I'm a, a, basically a Vice President of Engineering, but without the burden of managing people or budget. So I, that gives me the ability to, to really hype, be hyper-focused on a particular strategic uh, activity. And blockchain is, is my, my particular focus area. And so what I do for United Health Group and, and Optum is to educate uh, both our internal organization as well as externally, uh, help assess the fit for purpose for use cases, whether a use case makes sense for the technology, guide projects that are implementing, and then also establish and oversee an implementation of a strategy around the technology. So to get started, I think what we'd like to do is to ask our audience a couple of questions. So uh, Anthony, would you, can you open the polling for us? Just did that for you. Great. So there's two questions, and we're going to give you a few minutes to answer them. And um, the first question has to do with the audience's current understanding of blockchain technology. We've offered you a whole range of uh, answers. Uh, first one is, what's a blockchain? And uh, the second one is, I've heard of it, but I'm not sure what it is. C is, you can see a progression here. I can explain the difference between Bitcoin and blockchain, which, which John just did, so maybe everyone's going to say C. Uh, D is, um, I know what type of business problems can be addressed with blockchain, and that is a, a key um, maturity level in your organization, if you can do that. And then E would be that you're a blockchain geek. I can explain how blockchain works. And so we're going to give uh, people a couple of minutes to do that. And Anthony, is the second question also available, or do we have to wait for that one? Uh, it should be. Do you want me to read it out? No, I can read that out. So it looks as okay. though once you've answered the first question, then the second question will um, show up. And this is really around what your organization plans are around blockchain. So if in the, in the area of surveys, I've seen answers that uh, – 2% of organizations plan on putting something into production, and I've seen uh, uh, survey results that say nearly 80% plan to do so in the next year. So we'd like to understand what your plans are uh, from your organization standpoint for using the technology. So first question uh, uh, response would be that you really don't have that much interest, but maybe you're just curious. Um, the second, the second answer is that you're curious. You're interested, but you have no immediate action plans. Uh, third option is that it's in your medium or long-term planning horizon. Um, the fourth one is it's in your short-term planning, or you're actively doing something. You're experimenting, creating proofs of concepts. And then the last one is that you've already invested and actually deployed something, perhaps in a pilot. So that, those two questions will help. We'll, we'll revisit those answers um, that you've provided in the next couple minutes. No, so right. let's. So uh, we're gonna, and, go ahead. We're going to go ahead and close that first question because I don't think our quest, second question is showing up. Maybe we have to close the first one. So go ahead and just finish up with the first poll, and we're going to close that now. And. You can continue. I think I'll see if I can get that second question up. Go ahead, Mike. Do you want me to go to your second slide? Yeah, go to the next slide. So okay. um, Optum has been looking at uh, blockchain technology for over two and a half years now. And um, because of the size of our organization, we were able to elicit ideas from around the organization and found uh, we had a, a, a large number of use cases to assess. But one of the challenges that we faced was trying to understand um, we could use a blockchain for that use case, but the real question at hand is should you use a blockchain for those use cases? And through experimentation and, and learning, we've established these, these two perspectives on understanding whether a blockchain makes sense for a particular use case. And on the left side, um, the one-liner that I like to use is that the blockchain is most useful, the technology is most useful when you're dealing with multiple organizations. 
that are relatively independent of one another. Another way to say that is loosely coupled. And those organizations could be companies or they could be um, government entities as well. But when those entities want to confidently share and audit that information and then begin to use something called smart contracts to help automate processes that happen to cross those, those entity boundaries. So really thinking about the nature of the problem when you're looking at maybe an existing problem area in your, in your business processes. The, the business problem characteristics that are best aligned with the use of this technology is when the business problem currently has multiple enterprises and each enterprise has their own copy of information, basically islands of data. And that data can fall out of sync. And as a result, it's inconsistent. And that kind of, um, that kind of um, inconsistency can lead to um, issues with transactions across those enterprise boundaries, and there's a high cost of reconciling the differences in that information. So there's an administrative cost associated with redoing work. And an example here is in claims processing, and many times uh, information is inconsistent between the provider and the payer. As a result, there needs to be some follow-up calls or faxes, and there's, there's a high cost associated with doing that. And then the last aspect is, if, if there's a lack of complete trust between the organizations involved in this, um, in this business problem that you're dealing with. So really, two perspectives of the kind of business problem and then um, where uh, the, the scenario where uh, enterprises who want to accomplish um, improvements to those transactions, what to do with loosely coupled organizations. So if we can move to the next slide, um, the, the, um, because the technology is most suited for, best suited for multi-enterprise business problems, we began to look at, well, what kind of healthcare problems would be best suited to solve across enterprises, and how do we go about getting those enterprises to work together? Essentially, we have competitors that have common problems that, um, that the natural next step to accomplish uh, solving of these problems is the creation of collaborations or alliances. And in April of this year, um, uh, these five companies on the right side, Humana, Optum, Multiplan, Quest Diagnostics, and United Healthcare, decided to get together to collaborate on, uh, on uh, some of the hardest problems in healthcare. And we have since branded this alliance, and it's now called the Synaptic Health Alliance. And you'll notice that technology is not in the name and blockchain is not in the name. And the idea is that this is one of our first steps toward a greater healthcare industry collaboration. But what we found is that blockchain has really drawn us into this initial alliance in our initial use case. And it really has to do with the fact that we have multi-enterprise, islands of information, and because we're competitors, we're a little bit skeptical about working together. And this is where blockchain comes into play. And the business, the very first business problem that we're going to work on is highlighted in the next slide. Now, John made, uh, uh, alluded to this, it's the product provider data management. So Anthony, if you can move to the next slide, please. Okay, I think we're there. All right, well, it's not showing up for me, so I'm assuming we're on the next slide. First so, use case, provider directory maintenance. Yep, current yep, 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 I got it, thanks. It's just not showing up on my, my WebEx. Okay. So, so this business problem is related to um, provider directories. And collectively across the industry, uh, providers and payers spend in excess of $2 billion maintaining this information. And it affects everybody in the value chain. It affects patients because patients depend on insurance companies, uh, provider directories that um, can be uh, inaccurate. And that inaccurate provider directory can lead to access to care issues for the patient showing up to the wrong address or, 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 or believing that a, a provider is accepting new patients when they're not. Pa 
payers are are responsible for that uh, directory and um, would like to have an improved patient experience, but also face steep fines from inaccurate provider directories from regulatory bodies. And so as a result, the payers tend to, um, because they have a contract, because they're dealing with the same provider, oftentimes overlapping provider populations, multiple insurance companies are duplicating this curation process of verifying that the information is up to date. And so the provider is facing a great deal of friction, and um, and this is due the friction is due to all of these different insurance companies coming to the provider to verify the provide the accuracy of the provider demographic information, and so everybody these three the the payers the patients and the providers are all affected by the inaccuracy of this information and actually are are um, somewhat frustrated by the overall. Uh, process in itself. And this information, this provider information, is not really competitive information. It's really something that everybody needs to use as part of doing uh, their part of the business. And so if we move to the next slide, uh, that worked this time. Um, the use case that we're working on is utilizing a blockchain to streamline the back office operations to actually share that information across the different entities. Now you can see that in this case it's called, it's, it's called PDX, it's called Provider Data Exchange, and it's a blockchain-based conduit where the alliance members can share the attestations. That is, if one of the partners or two of the partners in the alliance have already curated the information, there's very little reason for other members of the alliance to do the same thing. And let's say that you, you haven't done the curation yourself. You can see that two or three of your alliance members have already checked the, the accuracy of that information. And so from the standpoint of quality, it's been double or triple checked already. So we anticipate our hypothesis is, and this is one of the things that we're working on this summer to prove out during our pilot, is that we can depend on other members to update and um, double and triple check this information so that other members don't have to do the same thing. And so quality, the theory is the quality should go up and operational costs should come down because not everybody has to do the same curation process. So we, we believe that, and we're testing this hypothesis as part of the pilot, as I mentioned, that will improve director directory quality and will reduce the costs associated with that curation. And there should be fewer outreaches to providers. Now, we're going to be providing uh, a lot more information. We're going to be publishing a white paper, and that will be available uh, very soon now on the website that's located in the lower left-hand corner of this slide, where you'll be able to get a lot more information, frequently asked questions, uh, like I mentioned, the white paper. And uh, also, over on the right side, you see a bit of a hint that we're going to, that there's going to be future partners. We will, in the next 30 to 60 days, hope to announce a couple of other name brand Alliance members in the Synaptic Health Alliance. So that's our update. Um, any, uh, back to you, Anthony. All right, let's take a look at the poll results. I've actually got them written down here so we can discuss them. On the first right. question, on the first question, what is your current knowledge level of blockchain technology? We see only 5% are questioning what's a blockchain. So perhaps Dr. Halamka's presentation has helped, but in any case, very few uh, don't know what a blockchain is. The rest of the answers, we have it pretty evenly spread out. 24%, I've heard of it, but not sure what it is. 24%, I can explain the difference between Bitcoin and blockchain. 27%, I know what type of business problems can be addressed with blockchain. And 19%, I can explain how a blockchain works. So what are your thoughts on that sort of spread of answers, Mike? Well, I, I view that as a, a maturity a learning curve of, for the industry that, you know, if we were to ask this question two years ago, we would have been skewed closer to the A's and the B's. But I see that there's a growing awareness of the technology and also where it should be applied as opposed to where it could be applied. 
All right, very good. And then we will take a look at our second question. What are your organization's plans for using blockchain, blockchain technology? Only 9% have no interest, which I would imagine is concerning uh, who are those 9%. Um, interested but no immediate action plan, 43%. In medium wow. or long-term planning, 23%. In short-term planning or actively experimenting, and have already invested and deployed 17%. Mike, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, could you repeat the short-term planning? There was a bit of a cutout there. Short-term short planning or actively experimenting, 6%. Wow, okay. So the majority is interested, but no immediate uh, action. It was like 40%? 43%, correct. 43%, wow. So this is, um, this is about where I would expect to see um, our industry at this point, largely because of the high degree of hype and uncertainty of where the direction is for this technology, and also the, uh, the very difficult job of determining uh, the reason why you do it and the incentives when implementing it. And until we've established, I, we, when I mean we, the industry, until the industry has been able to demonstrate some success stories, I think we're going to largely see the early adopters um, who have a high degree of risk tolerance to be actually taking the short-term planning, experimentation, and deploying. So I'm not that very surprised. I expect to see the median answer to this shift closer to uh, C and D over the next two to three years. Very good. All right. We have uh, a little time for our Q&A, just a few moments here, so I want to get some uh, audience questions out to our guests. Uh, first question for all, let's start with you, Dr. Halamka. What options exist to handle data for patients who are in-house during the migration? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm reading the wrong question. Uh, on September 21st, the proposed HHS CMS rule was received in the list of regulatory actions currently under review by the OMB. Is Dr. Holomka able to provide any details on what his HHS CMS, uh, this HHS CMS proposed rule covers? This is, title is uh, Interoperability and Patient Access. Dr. Holomka? Well, absolutely. So I uh, actually contacted my uh, folks my friends at CMS and asked them that question. And their response was, well, we can't give you any details yet, but assume that uh, CMS believes interoperability is incredibly important and it will be convening stakeholders and it will be working on a, a rulemaking to enforce uh, you know, existing interoperability standards and to encourage the sharing of data. So that's about as much as I could get for you. All right, uh, very good. Next question. In attempting to deal with the opioid crisis, Congress has some proposals, and one of the sticking points is loosening some restrictions on sharing behavioral health data with regards to addiction. Dr. Holomka, what do you think about this notion? Right, so 42 CFR Part 2 is a challenge. And so let's imagine, see, Anthony, I won't pick on you, I'll pick on me. Suppose, it. and this is of course completely false, but I went to a federally funded substance abuse treatment center, and while I was there, I said, oh, I'm allergic to penicillin. Today, 42 CFR Part 2 prevents the sharing of that penicillin allergy, right, because it happened in the context of a federally funded substance uh, abuse treatment center episode of care. So imagine then I go to some other hospital and I get penicillin and I die. <laughs> So I think there's this recognition that 42 CFR Part 2 was w well intended at that time, but now needs to be rethought because safety and quality really depend upon data sharing in a thoughtful way while still respecting the patient's uh, consent preferences. Very good. All right. Did you have any thoughts on either of those questions, Mike? No, I thought John answered those great. All right. Well, we have we only have about uh we're about out of time. So I think we are going to wrap up there. When we close out our Webex window, you're going to be taken to a post event survey. If you take take a moment to answer, 
The survey we'd appreciate regarding continuing edu education, those of you who hold the CHIME CHCIO certification get one CEU for attending our event, so let CHIME know you, know you were here. Know uh, you were here, and if you've asked us to do so, we will. You'll receive an email when our archive recording of this event has been posted to our YouTube channel. If you'd like us to produce a webinar on the topic of your choice, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox on our team, and you can go to our website to see our upcoming schedule. So with that, I, want, I very much want to thank our panel, our very informative pa panel, Dr. John Halamka, Mike Jacobs, and Optum for sponsoring this event. I want to thank you, our attendees, for continuing to join. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.